So my question for Warren is, um, is, is there some, are there some regions that you are continue to be concerned about in terms of the information that you're able to get and the improved information that would help you with your, uh, with the World Board, with its, with its production estimation? And if so, is there something that, that NASA could do to help with reduce that uncertainty? So that's my question, and we have a broad remit to answer that in any way you would like. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think uh, even though we, we've uh, uh, developed a, a lot of techniques and advanced a lot since uh, we first started the uh, WASD estimates back uh, after the Great the Green great Robbery um, in the early 1970s, um, that's, that's still the place where we're, we're, we're uh, still looking, where we have four estimates. We're, we're looking at, at Russia. The, uh, wheat exporter, and uh, China is still uh, a place where we really need to use uh, outside observations uh, to, uh, and the Earth observations uh, assist greatly in being able to, to forecast production uh, in those areas. So, uh, in some ways, um, we've, been, we've, we've come a long way, and in some ways, we're, we're still uh, at, a, at a higher, at a higher and better level. Uh, we're still looking at the same regions uh, that we're sort of. Black holes before uh, are still uh, uh, known unknowns, and, uh, and that's where I think we're going to continue to have uh, collaboration uh, and, and improving our estimates. And is there, uh, are, are there areas where you would like to see a stronger collaboration between NASA partners and USDA, so more broadly? <laughs> uh, sure. If, you know, uh, I, I mean, I think it is a, it, it's a good partnership, it's good coordination. Uh, I think that, um, uh, as we were telling about just before, uh, before the session, uh, we always struggle with um, that nexus between uh, tool development and operational use of the tools. Uh, so, uh, in some ways, sometimes I think the, uh, the enthusiasm for building new tools gets ahead of uh, where we can use them. Uh, we need to have the need to have the, the, uh, the expertise, the FTEs in-house to be able to take those, take that information and, um, and, and, and nurture it. I, I kind of uh, look at it as similar to, um, you know, to, to building infrastructure. It's, it's always, uh, it's a lot easier to get something built uh, than it is to maintain it. You can, you can have a ribbon cutting on a new bridge. Uh, you don't have a ribbon cutting when you and, and, and take care of and, and it. And it kind of goes that way with some of the, the tools that we, that we see uh, and, and with the development needs to really focus on uh, getting that uh, operational implementation and getting the support that I don't think NASA can pay for the rest of the employees. So uh, that's, that's where we need to uh, go hand in hand in, in terms of supporting Great, thank you. The as we go on in the discussion, I think we'll be getting back when we get to planet at the uh, towards the end. We'll talk about how far can we go without the benefit of in situ ground measurements. How far can we push the technology where we don't have access into areas either because it's a conflict zone or because um, you know it's very difficult for people. We talked a little bit earlier about uh, in the day about the China initiative to try to beat down the uncertainty there. But I think we ought to, we're going to have quite a bit of discussion, I think, about ground data collection. But there are places where that's extremely difficult. We need to look at what can we do in those areas and how do we, how do we sort of uh, manage in a situation where there's a very sparse ability, uh, sparse data and ability. So, good, thank you. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> John Luke, I have a question for you. This is staying more on the sort of policy side, on the agricultural side. Um, the, e <clears throat> the EU is, is uh, starting to apply EU technology to meet its policy needs. Can you talk a little bit about how you integrate EO into your agricultural policy and uh, uh, give your thoughts on, on that experience and how that's happened and what it's taken to get there? So the, I think the short answer, or a medium, I, a medium answer would be fine. Yeah. By, de, by design, 
<laughs> uh, and I, I, I will explain a little bit. So, yes, we're looking at, uh, but I'll take a step back. So, the EU, we run in a seven year budget. Don't be jealous. We actually have a seven year budget. And so, we're right on the verge of getting the new common agricultural policy in place, which is starting in 2021 and run to 2027. And it will represent 52 billion euros a year. So it's a big chunk of money. But it also has an impact on a lot of other societal practices. And compared to another, another step back, and we have an approach to earth cultivation in Europe. Um, we use it as a tool at the level of the European Union. Um, we have a Korean system where earth observation is a tool in service of policy. Agricultural policy is one example. Environmental policy is another. Transport policy, border protection, climate change. We use earth observation as a tool. And this is the basis on which the Copernicus program was developed 20 years ago. And we didn't get there really easy. It was a maturation process where we started from research and development to refine user needs, how we can address them, the services which are needed. And everybody thinks about Copernicus as a space program. It's true. Benjamin will confirm to you that we spend a lot of money on the space infrastructure. But actually, Copernicus is about delivering services. Services based on Earth observation data from space, institute data, services which are readily usable by decision makers. And this is, this is a, a big difference. And the premise of Copernicus is really make the data accessible and actionable. So we have the data available on a full, free, and open basis. So accessible to anybody, anytime. We, we ensure that the data is sustainable on a long term. Already now, with the financing we have, the data which is provided is ensured at least until 2030. With the new framework, we're going to go, go much farther. And, and um, lastly, um, I said the services are de designed to respond to policy needs. We also have put in place a number of actions to ensure uptake of the services and of the data by users. This is true uh, for the agricultural policy, where we integrated, I, I talked earlier about Copernicus as a tool for policy. Um, we have developed an agricultural policy, which is implemented via regulation law, which is adopted by the Parliament and the Council in Europe. And we have a tool, Copernicus, to help decision makers in the EU, but also in member states, implement this policy. So we're really talking about a coherent system where we have an entity implementing also a service, which creates the link to the users and ensures a feedback loop to make sure that the evolution of the needs um, feeds into future evolutions of the missions. Benjamin is going to talk more about this. How we link the user needs and the development of future missions and evolutions. Um, you talked about evolution a quick word. I talked about 21, 27. And at the moment, we have Sentinel-2 A and B, Sentinel-1 A and B. We will finance, and ESA is uh, constructing C, Sentinel C and D for 1 and 2. And we'll also improve uh, the services we use uh, on the basis of the land monitoring service for monitoring compliance, uh, for monitoring the performance of the common agricultural policy, and provide downstream applications to farmers and businesses using that's an answer. Mm. That's great. That's really important. It's possible to clear that. And I'll just, just say a comment on that. I mean, having the US has been a strong advocate of free and open sharing of data for years. And we were really the lone voice in the wilderness uh, providing free and open data. And I have to say, it's, um, it's a relief to me and for those of us working in agriculture that Europe has come forward and, and is playing in, in that same arena of free and open sharing of data. And I'm hoping that that model is going to then translate to India and China doing the same thing with their satellite data because 
they've been a bit slow to come forward in that data sharing. And I think that's having Europe at the same table, free and open sharing data, has been a fantastic advance. And I think what we're seeing just in our program alone is the uptake of data from, from the Sentinels has been strong and to know that it's there for a long period of time is going to be a fantastic opportunity for us to develop operational capabilities that rely on data coming in. So I'm, mean, you know, kudos to Europe for sort of picking this up because I think if we were back in the days of land, sound and motors, we would still be in the 1980s mentality of, of how we do agricultural remote sensing. So thank you very much. So Kirsten, slightly different jump now to more on the humanitarian side. USAID is a big, big organization. You, you're in part of that. And uh, I was going to ask you from your perspective, really, how, <clears throat> how do you see the, uh, the pri priorities for Earth observation um, and the biggest input that we can make in terms of, or the impact we can make in terms of the sorts of work that you and your colleagues are doing? Okay, um, thanks. So in terms of use of Earth observations, uh, for our bureau, which is the Bureau of Food Security at USAID. Um, right now we have kind of a short to medium term vision um, to enhance our work by using Earth observations um, data and applications throughout our program cycle. So when I say program cycle, that means the process of um, activity, planning, design, impl implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. Um, so for example, at the project design stage, we could use these data to answer questions like uh, what activities are the most appropriate to implement in this place? Um, what kinds of uh, crops are most likely to succeed? What types of influence or management practices would best be recommended for a certain location? Um, our observations data can also help us to better understand some of the drivers of food insecurity. For example, uh, farmer pastoralist conflict. So by better understanding um, some of these issues, it can help us um, make better, uh, design better activities um, at the planning and design stage. Um, in terms of implementation, what does integration of Earth observations mean at, at, at that stage of the program cycle? Well, we can think of it um, even as something as uh, sort of maybe mundane as uh, supervising activity implementation. If we have a mission who's, uh, because of the security situation in the country, can't travel out to the field, to supervise an activity, we could use Earth observations data to make sure that there's actually an activity going on in the location and at the scale that uh, was intended. Um, other ways um, at the implementation stage that we could use these data would be in terms of adaptive management. So if we use the capacities that have been developed and refused um, to, to uh, know better when a drought is coming, uh, we can take that information, and that information should lead to a decision whereby we say, you know, we were supposed to be providing planting material to farmers in this place, but now we know that there is a drought that's expected. How do we pivot to a different type of activity that allows us to still have uh, positive programmatic impact um, without without loss or loss or wastage? So um, these are the kind of things that allow us to stay accountable to all of the stakeholders, um, including. Uh, taxpayers. Um, in terms of monitoring our activities, I think this is the place where Earth observations data have kind of emerged first, kind of in, in our work. Uh, um, Earth observations data can help us monitor specific outcomes of interest, like production, crop production, um, and also help us stay cognizant of the agrometeorological context in which um, we can interpret <coughs> our uh, indicators like yield or um, trends in indicators like yield or input use or even area under cultivation. Um, so, so um, finally, using Earth observation data for impact evaluation, I think, and, and maybe I'm a little biased, but it's, uh, I think, one of the most exciting frontiers um, in the area of evaluation research. So, um, in terms of priority, so, so that's, a, that's a vision. Um, and for impatient people, um, unfortunately, that division, that that vision doesn't get realized quickly or overnight. But um, where can we start to um, kind of take steps to implement, uh, take steps towards uh, implementing and realizing that vision? Um, sometimes they can be a little opportunistic or ad hoc. But that's, that's kind of where we are right now. Um, three examples that I can I can um, think of that would be indicate kind of 
where we are in that process. Uh, first, uh, activities around communicating and reaching out to uh, colleagues within our bureau about the value and utility of these data. Big first step for us. Um, then the next step out, um, or maybe something we can do simultaneously, is communicating with missions. And actually, colleagues at NASA Harvest and Catherine have really been instrumental in helping us um, develop uh, communications tools to talk to our missions about um, what these, what these uh, data can, use, uh, can be used for uh, in their day-to-day -day work. Um, as well as things like um, the monthly theme on um, use of Earth observations that was uh, in May, where we kind of every single day in the month of May, we pointed out to all of our stakeholders, these are the ways that Earth observations can be used in your work, regardless of what aspect of the sphere and agriculture you are working on. This is how these data are relevant. So these are the kinds of uh, initial activities that we can undertake to help us get to the next uh, step down the road. Um, Others include um, formulating technical responses to non-technical priorities like budget constraints. So, um, as mentioned previously, uh, surveys uh, can be expensive. We need to we need that surveys. Um, but are there cost-effective ways of integrating survey data with Earth observations data that allow us to more cost-effectively gather the data that we need to monitor our activities? Um, uh, at lower cost and perhaps even greater frequency over time. Um, and then finally, where we do have missions who are have early interest, express early interest in the use of these data for their programmatic priorities, um, one thing that we can do is really try to nourish those missions with the kind of information and um, uh, support they need. So not only we help them to meet their needs, their programmatic needs, uh, but also to develop positive use cases to show other missions or other parts of the agency um, what the real value is of this data for the tech work that we do. Great, thank you. Awesome. Formulate my question. Uh, so for me the Gates Foundation has, has, has been playing an increasingly important role, filling a vacuum where uh, national governments and international agencies haven't been able to move as nimbly and I think one of the great things about the foundation is that it can move pretty quickly to address real needs and I know Gates Foundation has been looking at improving livelihoods for smallholder farmers uh, in many ways not just in terms of, uh, of agriculture but in, in your in your role as the agriculture strategy developer what uh, what's the role of Earth Observation for the Gates Foundation and what are the priorities that you see in Clarify them in a team which uh, <laughs> thinks about those things. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I'm going to say those of you who work with the foundation know that it's a it is a dynamic place and things change quite a lot. It's not always really easy to work with. Um, and I just want to say a bit about the strategy evolution because it's a sort of important historic context. Um, I think David Berkinson sitting here. There was a strategy, a digital strategy that included a lot of spatial dimension. We had and early what we call the learning grant with uh, folks in the room here, with Inbel, with yourself, with Catherine, with uh, Sibiri, um, on the STARS grant, which was a very successful grant, but at the time, it finished 2015, 16, much of our strategy switched from a sort of global public good to a very country-specific focused strategy. Uh, we've had some teething problems adjusting to that, but it's now running pretty smoothly. I think the pendulum swung a bit too far, and now we're sort of coming back to that. So we've not sort of left the idea of uh, Earth observation being an, an incredibly strategic uh, aspect of our strategy, but we don't have a strategy about Earth observation itself. The way it's playing out at the moment is it's embedded within a few of our more strategic bodies of work. And those would be, for example, our digital pharma services uh, team. Uh, there's sort of six fairly active uh, teams within the Ag Dev and Digital Partner Service of one in some, in some sense a bit of a heritage of, of David's days, which is split between uh, digital advisory services uh, delivered to farmers, digital financial services, which include things like insurance, but also smart farming, the concept of precision agriculture taken down to, to uh, small farmers. So this is a, 
is a body of work that's in a sort of embryonic stage. They have a strategy. They're having sort of what we call these learning grants and, and on the ground. So that is that is a good place to maybe start having conversations. Uh, my colleague, maybe Tuban or Stuart Collis, who may be around here, uh, but Stuart not, um, are leading that part of the work. So there is a, a sort of one sort of embodiment of uh, a set of very focused products and services, but in, within which uh, earth observation is, is really a critical part. Another one is in uh, a really sort of exciting body of work we have about crop uh, livestock pest and disease, epidemiology, surveillance, monitoring. Um, and that, of course, relies a lot on the satellite. And I also wanted to sort of say, I also not wanted to spend much time on new forecasting, but all these other applications. Uh, so there's the biotic side as well as the uh, abiotic side of that. But there's also, uh, and I know some of you in this work are, uh, are working on the applications sort of of remote sensing beyond uh, things that influence farmers, but they're not necessarily about crop yields or area. They're about assets and welfare and about uh, even population uh, ways of doing sort of more objective estimates of population monitoring infrastructure, water management. These are other areas where I think we are very interested in building those into uh, our strategies. The other part of that is, um, again, all of these are sort of embryonic pieces of bodies of work, is because we now have much more country-focused strategy, is what does this mean in terms of the national sort of architecture within a country, where, as we've heard from many sort of the speakers today, um, it's not just having cool tools and really powerful technologies. If they're not trusted, they're not validated, they're not operational within the country context within their work, they are not going to be broadly accepted. They're not going to integrate with, in our case, we have the National Agricultural Investment Plans, uh, speaking of climate adaptation, which I will in a minute, uh, National Adaptation Plans. Uh, the, how we sort of find solutions to that. We don't have a solution to that. We know there are platforms, there's Radiant Earth, there's uh, Earth Africa, there's uh, the Maxa, there's uh, planets, all, all have sort of continent-wide, sort of wall-to-wall, uh, -wall, probably always on sort of coverage of things or collections of data for that. But how do you bring that sort of continental-wide capacity to be operational and functional within a country context that it serves governments, private sector, and others in there is a, is a sort of there's a, there was a few other things. I, I, a couple of areas, or three areas, I wanted to sort of think of as opportunities, which are sort of manifestations of within our strategy, where I think harvest and earth observation sort of could be sort of uh, particularly helpful. And one of the, the problems we have had is that I mean we probably have two or three institutions, organisations, individuals a week coming with a, the, the coolest, most accurate crop yield forecasting application that we should be funding. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of dynamics in this area, there's a lot of public sort of private sector. But we've been trying to, we've, I mean, we've been burnt a few times trying to pick winners in any of these areas. And so what is the sort of um, most strategic thing we can do with philanthropic dollars to uh, cause innovation, to spur innovation, to make that innovation accessible to all? And we think ground truthing, and again, we're emerging body of work around Sort of gold standard open uh, validation data sets, to, but that would both spur innovation of tools by both the public and private sector. But just as importantly, uh, it's for the consumer side is to know when you're offered a product or services, a service, what benchmark do you have about how reliable? Everybody will say it's the best in sliced bread, and they will always compare it back to USDA, even if it's you know uh, some test they did in in the US, not necessarily back into sort of the context of what trying to work. So that sort of, uh, the, this ground truth in body of work, I think, is one where we feel we could play a role in facilitating greater innovation by public and private sector, and also uh, on the consumption on the, on the consumer side to understand better what to, to test against, have benchmarks to test against. Uh, the other one, and again, just opportunistically, uh, Emily Hope is in the room, uh, the college is here also, is this uh, 50 by 2030 initiative, which is uh, the role of Earth observation in the context of strengthening agricultural statistics in low and middle income countries. 
And there, there's, there are sort of proven methodologies uh, that come from a sort of more survey-based approaches of uh, LSMS itself, the, the standard measurement survey um, study that uh, World Bank uses, that we've heard about a lot today. Um, taking that and linking it to a system that the FAO developed around a cluster, a system of agricultural surveys. And that, that being done with a greater emphasis of the role of Earth observation within that whole system. And I would encourage uh, Harvest and the 50 by 2030 because it is a, it's not a sort of pipe dream, it's actually going ahead, but it's still being developed, but it's, it has significant funding at the moment, and there's a promise of great funding. Sorry, the 50 by 2030 is 50 countries by 2030 will have this capacity to use uh, these sort of tools. Uh, the other one is around um, climate adaptation, and again, just being opportunistic, we have people in the room who are working on the Global Commission on Adaptation. Bill is a, one of the co-commissioners of that, um, and uh, some of Molly Brown and others who are in the room working on the, the, the Global Commission report that will come out in September, and then there'll be two year or a year of activities around action tracks. We are very interested in uh, food and agriculture. Bill is trying to double the amount of funding going to national to international agricultural research. But one of the things we found is very limited access of available information around where which particular climate stresses or climate variability or extreme events or or sort of clusters of those events will happen on top of which smallholder farming system, so uh, across the vulnerability of those. So bringing that information forward would be incredibly useful uh, to this large amount of money that's, that is being promised, at least, for climate adaptation. Uh, the effort of advocacy and fundraising will go on for the next two years, but spending of that money will take a little longer. But I do think there's a tremendous role that this community could play in bringing that evidence to the table, making it accessible, making it conform, uh, and, and linking it with all of the other sort of opportunities you have. Um, maybe I'll stop there. I just want to keep emphasize what many people have said already, is that uh, these things, uh, you know, when, when we, there is a failure between the outputs of research systems uh, because they're not operational. I think David uh, Lovell talked about this you know, you can't scale and scope and support operational functions in a research context itself. So those those institutions, or whatever they are, public or private, do need to be developed and they need to be sort of validated and have a presence on the ground. Again, Catherine's work in Uganda was successful because she was there mediating the access to that. And I think that didn't happen in Tanzania. There's a great system. Okay, it did, according to Inval. But when, <laughs> when, but if I, uh, so I you <coughs> ask the people at the minute, <laughs> you ask, so, so what do you do with that report? Well, they publish that report, but you know, it's that, it's then what happens to it? What is that? How do you facilitate that? That is becoming I think it's a really pretty thing. Thanks. Good. Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, let me go back to my script. <laughs> So um, back to now the uh, the EO part of this of this equation. Um, as I said earlier, we've all benefited benefited from the benefits program and for agriculture in particular because of the increase in temporal resolution, spatial resolution, and this long term better continuity. And so I think that that's you know this has really been uh, transformational. We've heard that a number of times today. So my question for you is, can you give your perspective on how ESA integrates the Earth observation into the policy in context of really matching missions to policy and how that's impacting the future plans for the ESA, ESA missions? Thanks for that opportunity to talk about that. And I mean, basically what we do in, in out of principle, all the missions ESA is uh, Building or designing, we designing it against user requirements. If it's a science mission, it's for scientific requirements. If it's for Copernicus uh, program, that is uh, an operational program, and that is then designing it against policies. And uh, there, the user requirements are collected by the European Commission, bringing matching that to a range of different policies, as uh, uh, we already heard. Um, but uh, then 
what is necessary to design a mission against that is traceability. It's really something to understand what is written in the legislative part of the regulation, uh, like the Common Agriculture Policy, which is uh, understandable by lawyers. We agreed about that before this meeting. Um, but uh, there is, that is driving long-term requirements, and that is also allowing them the long-term continuity of this funding. And that is bringing an operational system into place, which is billions of euros. Otherwise, it would be not able to, to be designed. So, what, what is needed is coming from that legal text, identify the users, identify the type of applications, identify what observation the requirements is needed, and then translate it into engineering. Um, I, the mission scientists are one of the six candidates we are proposing now for the expansion of the Copernicus um, um, program um, that is hopefully being funded. Uh, and there is money around for the next uh, seven years, we heard, so <laughs> it's, uh, well, yeah, it's cross fingers, but I think it's on a very good uh, uh, path in that. And one is, which is called, um, and I would like to use that as an example of how we design that. Um, it's, it's called the Lensas Temperature Monitoring Mission. And by chance, that is very responding to what Jim Reidenstein said this morning is, um, perhaps not chance, because it's important, this issue, water resource management for agriculture. It's very important. Everybody in the room knows it. And we don't have necessarily all the, uh, the question of measurements to, to manage that. So that is an observational gap. Um, at least, uh, if you think about, if you want to manage it at field scale, um, and I give you one example here. If you look into the water directive uh, framework in, in Europe, or the nitrate directive, that's uh, the pollution part, or even the, the common agricultural policy part, they, they ask if you have an irrigation scheme in place, it needs to be first of all authorized by. Um, national authorities. Um, it needs to be um, also monitored in terms of water use. So you could use a meter, but you could also use you know, space assets to, to monitor that. And do we understand how much water is being used by the, you know, the, the person who has the water uh, right? You need to do that on parcel level. So you already have the spatial resolution basically in Europe, with most of the on good part of the Parcels are below one, uh, around one hectare, and so you need to have 50 meter resolution basically in the further part. And, um, then at the same time, if you want to have a dynamic um, measurement of the, the water use, it, uh, the right evapotranspiration, and with that uh, giving uh, information back to, to the farmer to irrigate and manage the irrigation uh, part, uh, you need a one or two day revisit. With that, you go back and design your system. And uh, then you have the traceability, really, in terms of policy, application, observation, and then the, the mission requirements part. And that is something which really needs to be done consistently in traceability. So that's, that's one way how to, to make that work. And by the way, 50 meter resolution is effectively 400 higher than what we have in the moment in terms of you know, one or two day revisits, which in Fermat is one kilometer. So it's a big, big step forward. I want to raise one other part which is necessary to translate um, policies into what you know really needs is the information. And I think that's also what the Harvest Initiative is here around, is to translate that you need to do some, some R&D type of work. And uh, in, the, in the case of what you mentioned, the Common Agricultural Policy part, in 2017, DG Agri as a policy um, body was, was coming um, we had a meeting with them and they were asking us what is observable and what is possible to do these type of things. And we, we worked together with them over the last two or three years and there's, uh, there's DG and Ro involved, there's DG JRC involved on the European side, but to really understanding how you can translate that observation from space into relevant decision making part, you need r &D. you need to develop tools and you Maintenance, I totally agree, it needs to have another mandate, but you need to demonstrate it. That was what DG Agri asked us in 2017 demonstrate us early evidence to change our regulation. And what is written nowadays in this proposal of the Common Agriculture Policy is there's an area monitoring system 
with, uh, which needs to use sentinel data or equivalent, and that is more or less the wording, and um, that is important for each country needs to put this into place. And with that, you get actually uptake uh, and uh, the kind of legislative uh, power behind uh, bringing the Earth observation into operations. And there's a lot of work between that, but I think uh, DG Agli, uh, together with uh, the different uh, DGs in the, in the Commission, have done a tremendous work to make that link. That I think is, is also very important in, if you think about operationalizing these services. <laughs> so I've got a question uh, for Zara now. So Planet has emerged as, in the last few years, as a provider of daily fine resolution satellite data with increasing data quality, filling an important gap in what I was told as a student was going to be available in terms of multi-level sampling using satellite data. And clearly this is something that's, uh, that's now become a re reality for us. So could you talk a little bit about planets, uh, where you see planets role in agriculture food security and your vision for that? I've jotted a few topics that I think are interesting and, and I've been talking to people in the audience so it's helpful all of your input. The first thing that I think we are trying to do at Planet, we're humble. We have total, all of the world, only one farm buying data from us directly. So we rely on our partners and our partners are technically our customers and they build these very advanced analytics algorithms, last mile solutions. So we're not going to solve the problem ourselves. We need to accelerate adoption. And the adoption is by people who are specialists in certain regions or certain crops, or they know the local culture, or they know the local habits, practices. So we need to find these organizations for every region, every crop, every specialty area. And a few ways that we've been accelerating the adoption, some people are lucky and they have the backing of R&D. We just heard how R&D is very important. So the types of R&D you'll get will be venture capital in the Bay Area, or in other financial hubs, um, you'll have philanthropy, philanthropy coming in to help where they see a good opportunity, but maybe not the immediate, immediate commercial ROI. Um, but we also are seeing that we're getting people coming to us and saying, hey, we want someone who, knows, who uses your data for this purpose. And we happen to have a customer there and we can kind of match make too, sometimes for that secondary push that somebody might need from being a regional player to a global player. So we see ourselves in this partnership role and building these relationships that scale solutions. So that's one part of accelerating adoption. The second part that a few of you in the audience are aware of is our education and research program. So we have a pretty robust and um, favorably discounted education and research program for a lot of academics. I see some heads nodding. Um, why do we have that? We know that you're our R&D, you're our marketing branch. You're telling us what, you know, what is, we just talked about, observable and possible. Um, we can come up with some ideas, but Rocket scientists, rocket scientists aren't the best agronomists, so let's leave it to you guys, the specialists out here. And, and we are very active in that community. We want to hear from you, and we want to help you promote your work and see if that could eventually be commercialized. So that education research program is really important to us. Another one, you guys might be um, seeing Planet Images on in the media, in the press, uh, when we talk to journalists and work with them. There is not necessarily an immediate commercial Incentive there. It's great marketing for us to be on the front page of every newspaper out there with all the usually bad news that we're reporting. Unfortunately, it'd be great to see some good news coming out with Planet Imagery. But um, but it's really for us that's a strategic move, but also it's a mission thing. I mean, we're not going to hold back data and information because part of our mission is to be not only capturing the world daily to make it visible, but also accessible and actionable. So journalists are very very core to our our kind of company DNA. Nonprofits and humanitarian agencies are also really important. So we do offer you know discounts for nonprofits, but with humanitarian, we're actually actively involved in the International Space Charter. So having that, along with other organizations that are actively involved, um, a key part of our organization to get us our imagery where it's needed. So that's kind of on the acceleration side. I think that's one piece of it. Um, I want to go to the analogy that was said earlier about building tools versus operating and maintaining. So it's great to get the data out there, but um, unless you're, you know, some of the really informed academics here in the room, it might not be the easiest to use. And this is not only planet, it's all geospatial data. So there's a couple things we're trying to do to make it easier to use. Um, first of all, it's pretty easy to use it through our API, so we've, we've made it in a way that it's pretty easy to integrate our workflows. That's just the, the way we've structured our company from the beginning. But another thing we're working on is um, how could technical users use planet imagery to inform machine learning models or just basic algorithms they might be building with 
other data sets. So we're always excited when people can use free imagery instead of planet. You have to pay for our stuff. If you can find that you can solve your problems with other data, that's great. Um, I was speaking to someone in the audience and they mentioned that it'd be great to use our frequency and that deep stack for training data and also maybe for validation. And, and then you can run your models on, on whether it's Sentinel or Landsat, other data sources. So we, can, we see ourselves as supporting. And as um, you mentioned, filling in the gaps. So in cloudy areas in particular, we, we don't use synthetic aperture radar, so we're not um, seeing through the clouds, but if you're trying to capture every day and you get a cloudy day, you might get a non-cloudy day the next day. So we see a lot of uptick in, in really cloudy regions. So those were the technical users um, and how we're supporting people who already use GIS. For people who don't use GIS, which is majority of the world, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> We're, we're trying to find ways that we can maybe just build analytics and build tools and, you know, something in a format that's not a geotiff, maybe an Excel file or even just an SMS or something you can query. So our founder has a term he calls queryable earth, kind of like how you go into Google and type up, you know, how many trees are in this area, you could have that functionality with geospatial imagery. So that's not my vision, but that's our organization's vision of not even needing all these different loops and hoops and everything. We always need the experts, but wouldn't it be nice to have some tools that the average user could benefit from? The final thing, which, so we talked about adoption acceleration, we talked about execution and operating the tools. One thing that separates Planet from, from the industry right now is how fast we can move. And that's for good or for bad. Um, our product life cycle, our design cycle is about three to six months. So we've had 14 different builds in half a dozen years. And this is, it's phenomenal what these people are doing downstairs in our downtown San Francisco manufacturing facility. They're just pumping out satellites. And with that speed, we need to hear from the community what we can do better. So I think what's really exciting is we do have this culture of innovation, and that's typical in Silicon Valley, but it's not typical in aerospace. And it's not just Planet alone that was allowing this to happen. We benefited from cheaper launch costs. Um, I don't know if anybody stayed up till 2.30 a.m. last night watching the SpaceX launch, but I mean, we, ha we didn't have satellites on that launch, but we launched on SpaceX um, last year. So, you know, as that gets cheaper, our operating costs go down. So that's really good for us because we have to replenish our fleet um, given the, that they're in low Earth orbit. Another thing that's really been good for us is the cloud. It seems common sense to everyone today that you can kind of store files online, and, but we definitely are, I'm sure everyone in the room can remember walking around with a hard drive or a floppy disk or whatever it was. So if you couldn't store all the data, you couldn't even download. So I just wanted to highlight that we've, we're benefiting from all these trends. Our vision is we don't even know what the next trend is. I, I didn't know growing up that there would be a cloud and all the data could be there. So what would be the next thing that could unlock even more access to our data? We don't know yet. We're excited about that, but we want that feedback loop. So beyond just bringing people together, and making our data easier to use. We, we want to hear from you all, and I think that's what here at NASA Harvest, um, my role would be. Great, thanks very much. So, Loris, Loris but let, me, uh, let me give a little bit of a preamble. And I wanted to kind of go back to uh, when we started Harvest. So when we got the core proposals, we were kind of in shock. Um, there was everything in it, absolutely everything. It was. Um, working with government, working with non-government, working with foundation, um, international, national, farmers, humanitarian, it was everything. So we, we picked what we thought, where we had comparative advantage, of course that was the proposal strategy. And we partnered with people that were already working on areas that, uh, that we, we selected and had an advantage in those areas. And I think that that strategy has kind of paid off. In terms of being agile and flexible, which was your sort of comment at the beginning, I think that's something that we're really um, keen on, on demonstrating, and I think we've got to that point where uh, we're, we're able to move fairly quickly compared to the normal NASA programs where you're three years of funding and then you get a chance to repropose. Um, having said that, the, the strength of our program is really being on the international side. Benefited from GeoClan, we've invested heavily in Geo, and that's as a major support. You know, we've benefited and we've contributed to GeoClan, and I think it's a couple of the speakers mentioned that there's a real advantage of having an international framework under which you can do bilateral collaboration and you can work together with other partners. And I think increasingly we've got to work together internationally to solve these 
major problems in agriculture, both the technical problems and how you how you solve some of the problems in terms of getting reliable, robust products, but also the the problems of having to work together at the national level and making sure you don't overtax the rather fragile systems for agricultural monitoring. So I think having sort of given that little bit of a preamble, I'd like your sort of priorities for emerging priorities of harvest that you see now after this 18 months of, of activity. Great, thanks Chris. Um, and so from the international side, I'll pick up on that initially. I, I'll say the harvest keep going, um, very much keep going on that. Uh, that's one of the key items uh, and certainly the international crowd that's gathered here uh, certainly re reflects that. And so we certainly realize that their like GeoPlan was a, is a great example where I think it was a tool that was developed in cooperation with some of the user communities, and especially the economists and, and all. So I think that was a great example. Uh, and it is sort of nice to see that GEO played, an international body like GEO, played a role, sort of a role, sort of a neutral body where different countries and participating organizations could come together uh, and work to develop something like that. And so from the context of uh, harvest and the number of different organizations that are involved uh, or want to be involved uh, in terms of using some of these international bodies that can provide that most convenient and that neutral space, uh, I think that's a, it's a great way to, to proceed. Um, I think there's a danger in that having so many different groups being involved in this uh, internationally that you know it could be without some of these neutral bodies uh, it could be you know um, organizations getting in each other's way so I would encourage both priority wise and others to, to use some of these some of these bodies so that the different groups uh, can work together uh, towards these common goals so that's that's one aspect um, I, I certainly recognize that uh, one of the things about harvest in terms of being successful is it means that there's probably lots of other organizations that want to come in and participate and contribute and benefit and all that and so uh, it's sort of a nice nice problem to have uh, and so then it's a question of okay well how do we manage that uh, how do we manage expectations how do we manage scope how do we manage resources uh, and so that is something that I think we're gonna you know we're gonna have to contend with Brad you and me and, and many others uh, at Applied Sciences we're gonna have to contend with that and, and, and work with the Harvest team and the Harvest Consortium uh, and with all that um, I know we we certainly have asked Harvest, uh, knowing that this, you know, anticipating this, and even hearing these last couple of days, and probably tomorrow as well, uh, that there are more organizations that, that want to contribute and want to participate. Um, that from Harvest's perspective, it's going to take additional resources to help manage that interest uh, and in that engagement. Uh, and so we have and are at, we have asked and, and are asking. Harvest to sort of put together uh, the context and, and what is uh, what is that need uh, and what are the sorts of things you can do and what are the things you cannot do with the given resources uh, and so it's often the those things that cannot be done uh, that's really going to be helping us and you all advocate for what else could be done uh, with additional resources and so I'll emphasize that. This is more than just what NASA's funding can put forward, uh, and that if there is more that we want to be doing in this space, and if we have this list of things that, that Harvest cannot get to based on the common funding, or the, the present funding, uh, that those are the sorts of things that we can help provide to the community to say, well, okay, are there things that you all can, can help contribute to, or potentially even advocate for if Harvest is one of these great neutral bodies uh, that can help facilitate this work. So I'll put that out there. Um, but I will say that there are things that we have heard uh, within NASA, and we are recognizing the fact that it may be our role uh, to invest in some things. And so some priorities that we're having in the near term, um, we do have um, kind of identified some additional funds beyond what we're investing in harvest uh, to support things in the agricultural area. Uh, two of them I mentioned earlier today, soil moisture, on uh, evapotranspiration issues. Uh, and so we are looking to improve the soil moisture products that we have. Um, we've done some work, work and provided data products into Google Earth Engine. I think it's a 25 kilometer scale and we are doing some products over the next couple of years to reduce that to maybe at least 10 kilometer, perhaps not you know the, the, the small scale farmer, but uh, at least some efforts related to that. 
Uh, in addition, in the evapotranspiration space, uh, we certainly recognize that there's many, many different approaches to doing ET. Uh, some are for certain crop types, some are for certain regions, uh, and so we are going to be investing in the next couple of years to do this comparison, hopefully, so that this community can get a sense of, okay, well, which ET product is most appropriate for the particular issue, particular problem, uh, particular area that you're going to be working. So those are, those are some of the aspects. Uh, I'd also say that as NASA, um, per the decadal survey, if you're not familiar, um, in early 2018, the US National Academy of Sciences came out with their recommendations to NASA, NOAA, and USGS in terms of what we should be doing uh, in terms of research, applied research, and applications um, over the next 10 plus years in the area of Earth science. And so right now, we're looking at what are going to be our new satellite missions, what are going to be some of those new observing systems. Uh, this is the time for you all to get engaged if you want to influence what some of those are going to be. As I mentioned earlier today, things like latency, some of the resolution qualities, some of the swath and repeat rates and things like that. In addition, as these observing systems get formulated, there's going to be additional opportunities for you all to find out or to, to you all to either get simulated data to try to your systems, uh, either to enhance tools, in some cases maybe build new tools. Uh, so I would say that that's also an opportunity and potentially a priority for this community uh, to, uh, to, to weigh in and help influence where NASA's going to be going. Perhaps we're not at the, the level of uh, what the Europeans are in terms of the really long-term sustained observations. I know there's a lot of interest and desire by many people in the United States to, to do that, so we're envious of the long-term approach you're taking. Uh, at the same time, I think you know, NASA uh, has been looking at what are some of the new experimental approaches uh, to be doing some of these observing systems. And I know we're looking at new innovative ways uh, of doing it. So I would say that to the extent that you all want to weigh in on these and help influence what we're going to be doing, what we're going to be collecting, uh, both in the near term and then as you know, we've been looking at it 2025, I can't believe I'm saying that, but if you look out to what you're going to be doing in 2025, I hope you'll get engaged in the next decadal survey and help influence what uh, NASA and NOAA USGS are going to be doing into observing systems in the future. So that's, a, that's more of the longer term view of priorities. Good, thanks very much. Well, 2025 probably see me well gone out of the program, which is probably good news for everybody. But. Uh, just, I've got an opportunity now. I think we, we, I'd like to thank the panel for each of their, their comments.